All right, this evening we're returning to the Sermon on the Mount, and I, I'm, I'm thinking that, um, you know, this will be our last Sunday to look at it for a month, because during the month of October I want to deal with uh, Reformation themes um, to kind of help prepare us for what we're going to be seeing in the lectures that are going to take place in the evening. Uh, it, it's always helpful, I think, to keep things maybe on just uh, in one area rather than in several areas. It, if we get more of a saturation, perhaps uh, we'll be able to retain it uh, longer. But uh, so we'll, we'll look at this this evening, and then we'll perhaps return to this after the Reformation uh, series is over. But let's look at um, verses 14 through 16, and what I'd like to do is read verses 13 through 16, uh, just to remind us of what it is we saw this morning. Uh, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Well, may the Lord again bless his word to encourage us um, this evening. Now again, uh, just by way of reminder, this morning we saw that Jesus has made us to be salt uh, to this world, salt in this world. And again, I would just point out the fact that Jesus says, you are the salt of the world, just like he said, blessed are uh, those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are gentle, and so forth. This isn't something that we have to become in order to inherit the kingdom of heaven. This is something that through the Lord Jesus Christ we have become. Uh, we are salt to this world. Now remember that we saw as salt preserves what it is added to, salt is a preservative. As it stops the decaying effects of bacteria, so Jesus has put us into this world to be a preserving agent, uh, to be those who exert an influence, a moral influence on those around us, uh, both by the way that we live and also, of course, by what we say, uh, to keep them from moral decline in the same way that Jesus' presence and his ministry had a restraining influence, a purifying effect on the people of his day. Now again, there is a sense in which we don't need to try to be salt because we already are salt by virtue of the fact that His image is being formed in us by the Holy Spirit. You know, this is the effect that we will have on other people as we live like Jesus. But there is another sense in which we need to work at being salt. Uh, we are like Jesus in certain ways to a certain degree, but again, we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ more of his character, become more like him uh, by becoming more of what we read in the Beatitudes so that our saltiness will increase, our influence will be stronger on those around us. And again, remember that we saw this morning that this warning about salt becoming tasteless or not salty really has to do with people who don't know the Lord, who appear to be Christians, who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but really don't know him and eventually uh, fall away. Now this evening we're going to look at the next thing that Jesus tells us in the sermon, which is that he has made us to be the light of this world. So first of all, we want to see what Jesus means by the fact that we are light. Now, this morning we saw regarding salt, that the word can be understood literally and it can be understood symbolically. As salt uh, preserves food, that's what it's literally used for as well as to make it taste better, but I think the idea here is the preservation aspect of it. So we, as salts, are put here to preserve this world through our moral example and sharing the gospel. So it has a literal and a symbolic meaning, and the same thing is true with regard to light. Uh, this word, of course, can refer to literal light. In Genesis 1-3, we read those familiar words, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
God spoke the creative word into the darkness and light came into existence. And I think he's referring here to literal light. But obviously it can have a symbolic meaning as well. And as a matter of fact, as I was thinking about this Genesis 1 verse 3, about the Lord creating light in the darkness, perhaps that act was also a symbolic foreshadowing of what the world would become because of sin and what the world would do or what the Lord would do in order to redeem this situation by sending his son into the world. We're going to read in just a little bit here that into the darkness the Lord sent his son to be light. Now, light can have a variety of symbolic meanings in Scripture, and I think, of course, all of them are, are interesting and instructional. Light can be used to refer to God's glory, basically a visual symbol of His majesty. You might say, you know, again, His glory is basically um, His attributes. Um, it's, in this case, oftentimes in Scripture, it's represented as some sort of a luminous, shining effulgence. And as a matter of fact, we're reading the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 23 through 24, that one day that light of the God's glory is essentially going to fill the new heavens and the new earth so that we're no longer going to need the light of the sun. We read, and the city, that is the new Jerusalem, representative of the redeemed of all ages, has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So light can refer to God's glory. It also refers to the character of that kingdom, that inheritance that we're going to receive from the Lord, a kingdom that is a kingdom of light, which means it's a kingdom of holiness, moral purity. There's no sin there, no suffering, no effects of sin. Paul writes in Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Now, I realize that was a long quote, but it was a long sentence, and I didn't want to just break in anywhere. But notice, the Lord makes us to live as citizens of this kingdom of light while we're in this world as we then prepare to share in this inheritance of this kingdom of light. We've been rescued from darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Now, we can also refer to God's truth and the ability of that truth to show us the safe way to live, the psalmist represents it almost like a flashlight that lights our path so that we don't stumble and fall. He writes in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Um, I remember um, years ago when our family used to um, go out uh, camping that at night, you know, when there's not too much light out there and you're trying to find your way to the, you know, to the facility, you have to use the, uh, a flashlight, otherwise you either lose your way or um, can, can stumble in the darkness. And every time we'd turn that flashlight on to, to illumine the path, it reminded me of this particular uh, passage of Scripture. God's Word is like that, you know, morally in this world. It helps us to avoid the pitfalls of the world and to, well, stay on the path of safety. It particularly refers to the gospel that is able to save us from death. Jesus' ministry to the Jews when he comes to proclaim the kingdom of God is likened to the dawning of a great light in the middle of this hopelessness, this darkness of their moral depravity. We read in Matthew 4, verse 16, again speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, 
upon them a light dawned. And again, just think about what it was like before you came to Christ, before you knew the gospel. Uh, there's a lot of people today who really can't handle it and end up you know, not only running themselves into various things, perhaps using drugs or alcohol just to kind of anesthetize their brain so they don't have to deal with reality. Or they maybe check out of life by committing suicide because they don't have any hope. Uh, we have hope. Now, when it's used of man, it can refer to the hope that comes from the Lord's mercy, the Lord's dealing graciously with us. Uh, when Esther... Remember, Queen Esther, by God's grace, was able to convince King Ahasuerus uh, into issuing a law that empowered the Jews to defend themselves against their enemies. Remember, the Jews essentially uh, were defenseless, and they believed they were going to die because Haman talked the king into passing a law that the enemies of the Jews could kill them, and there's nothing they could do. Well, when Esther intervened and by God's grace succeeded, it gave the Jews hope the light of hope. We read in Esther 8, verses 16 and 17. When they heard of this decree, there, for the Jews there was light and gladness and joy and honor in each and every province and in every, each and every city, wherever the king's commandment and his decree arrived, there was gladness and joy for the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many among the peoples of the land became Jews, for the dread of the Jews had fallen on them. Uh, by the way, I should just make a footnote here. J to be a Jew doesn't mean to be uh, Hebrew. It means to be of the Jewish religion. So people proselytize, they can become Jews. So Gentiles are becoming Jews because of the fear of the Lord. This hope in the Lord was uh, something that gave light to David as well. We read in Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? I believe the word light there is referring to the hope that the Lord gives. And of course, when John the Baptist came preaching that the Messiah was near, it brought hope to those who heard him. And he was likened to a light that was shining in the darkness. Jesus says in John 5, verse 35, he was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. The light of, his, of that truth he was preaching brought hope to the people. It can refer to what we experience in our own minds when the light of God's word dawns, as it were, in our understanding, when we receive God's truth. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, verse 130, the unfolding of your words or the explanation of them or the giving of them gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Solomon writes in Proverbs 6.23, For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. So it can refer to, again, that uh, revelation of God in words uh, that can bring hope. But it can also refer to the revelation that God gives that we receive from him, of his existence that comes without words, essentially what we call the light of nature. You know, there's, there's wisdom, there's, there's information being communicated by what we see God has made. David writes in Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. He goes on to say it's not in so many words, but it does communicate information. It is, it is light to us. God reveals his existence to the point where Paul tells us no one has an excuse for not believing in the existence of God. And then finally, it can refer to the revelation of the gospel that he causes to shine from his people, from us in the form of a changed nature that demonstrates or proves that the gospel is true. Jesus tells us in verse 16 of our passage, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
Now, when Jesus calls us to be the light of the world, he's essentially incorporating several of these meanings. He's given us the light of the gospel, you know, his truth, the knowledge of how fallen man can be reconciled to God so that we can shine that light towards others. We've just seen he's given us the light of a changed nature. He's made us like Jesus so that by doing his works, we might adorn the gospel, might, as it were, beautify it by a life that measures up to the message that we're actually sharing with others and that we may prove the truth of the gospel. Sometimes that's all it takes. I remember when we were studying uh, uh, David Livingston, uh, the Scottish Presbyterian uh, missionary who essentially charted, uh, I think it was the southern part of, of Africa, and how Stanley went out looking for him. And Stanley was an atheist, but when he met uh, David Livingston, just the example of his life was so compelling that I believe he was converted. Uh, if Livingston had lived contrary to the scripture, it would have just proven him to be a hypocrite. But again, the gospel combined with a godly life is quite powerful. So he's given us the light of a changed nature. And he has done these things in us so that those who see us and hear us by God's grace might have light, the light of God's truth and the light of hope, the hope of eternal life as they embrace the Savior as he's offered to them through the gospel. Now, essentially, what Jesus has done for us is he has made us to be what he was in his earthly ministry. Jesus' life and his ministry is characterized by light. Uh, the Lord said through Isaiah, as he's talking about sending his servant, the servant of the Lord, into the world, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would be the light of the world. We read in Isaiah 49, verse 6, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Jesus came into the world to be the light of the world. When Jesus was born and he was presented to the Lord in the temple according to the law of God, the fact that he was to be the light of the world was revealed to Simeon by the Spirit. And we read this in Luke 2, verses 27 through 32. And he, that is Simeon, came, into the, came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people uh, Israel. You know, it's interesting that uh, Simeon, it was revealed to him by the Lord that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. And when he saw the child, he immediately recognized that that is who he was. The other thing uh, that is interesting here is that Simeon was just waiting for that event to take place so that he could depart and be with the Lord. But he saw the one who was actually going to open heaven for him in the Lord Jesus Christ, but not just for him and not just for the Jews but also for the Gentiles, for the entire world. Now, this light that Jesus shone in the world came in the form of, you know, it came in several forms, actually. It came in the form of his teaching. Uh, Jesus is our great high prophet, or our great, high, you know, or our great prophet, excuse me, who reveals God's will to us so that we may be saved. He has shown the light of God's truth to us, and I should mention he still does through his word. That light came in the form of miracles, that he powerfully demonstrated and proved that he was the one who he claimed to be. It came in the form of a godly life, of being an example of that truth, and it came in the form of hope. All who received him had the light of that hope of forgiven sins and eternal life. But again, let's remember what we saw this morning. Uh, that is true in the case of salt and in the case of light. When Jesus shone the light, there were two responses to it. Obviously, there were those who rejected it, 
who didn't understand it, who didn't see what it really was, its true nature, its true beauty. And that's because their eyes were blinded by sin. Uh, John writes in the prologue of his gospel in John 1 verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. Jesus comes into the world. He begins his ministry. The light begins to shine, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, this word translated comprehend can mean understand. They didn't understand it. There's a certain sense in which they didn't understand it. Or it can refer to overtaking or apprehending it. And I think both meanings might actually apply here. Those who were in the darkness who saw this light didn't understand the light in a certain sense. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 through 8. He says, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus, or excuse me, Paul here is saying that if these leaders, and I think the rulers of this age he has primarily in mind, the Jewish leaders, if they'd understood who he was, really saw who he was, they wouldn't have crucified him. The fact is, they didn't understand it because they were blind. You know, the Bible says that those without Christ are blind. They have a veil over their faces. It was because of this blindness that they rejected him. It's because of this blindness that they hated him. Jesus says in John 3, verses 19 through 20, a passage that keeps coming up in this context, Jesus is speaking. He says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So the darkness was not able to comprehend. It was not able to understand because it was blind and it hated the light. But in the sense of overtaking, the darkness was not able to overcome. It was not able to overtake the light, to swallow it up and hold it down and extinguish it. Those who hated the Lord Jesus crucified him, but he rose again from the dead. They tried to put out the light that he gave to his disciples, but the more they tried, the brighter the light became. You know, persecution is often that which makes the light burn more brightly rather than put it out. But as we also saw this morning, there were also those who received the light. Again, Jesus, after speaking about how the darkness responded to the light, he says in verse 21, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Yes, there are those in darkness who hate and reject the light, who don't understand it, don't see its beauty, but there were those who by God's grace love the truth, and I think according to this, were already walking in the truth so that when they saw him, they came to him. We just had a great example of that in Simeon. And Anna the prophetess also, when they brought Jesus to the temple, she also recognized the Messiah and prophesied regarding him. Mary and Joseph are other examples. Elizabeth and Zechariah, when they saw the Messiah, they received him as their Lord and Savior. So again, Jesus is an example of one who has the light, who shines the light, and again, there's this mixed response. There are going to be those who hate it. There's going to be those who love it by God's grace. Now again, when Jesus saved us, when he transformed us through his gospel by his Holy Spirit, when he worked these virtues that he tells us about in the Beatitudes into our lives, he was, as it were, handing that light to us so that we might continue to shine it in the darkness, even as he did, so that others might see the light and come to God through him. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 12, he says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, 
but instead even expose them, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. Jesus said, you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He says in Matthew 5.14, you are the light of the world. We are the light that Jesus has placed in this world through whom he intends to enlighten the world. Again, Jesus did this through his disciples, and his church has continued to do this throughout the centuries. The light has put the light in us in order that we might shine the light to others. Now, again, remember, this is really more of what we are than what we are to do. And what that means, what I want to focus on right here, is that we really cannot avoid being light. I mean, we don't want to avoid being light, but, but it's something we really can't avoid because being made like Jesus, we're going to shine. Jesus continues in verse 14 of Matthew 5, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Basically saying, you know, if you're going to build a city on top of a hill, you're going to expect for it to be seen because you can't hide something like that. Well, we are that city that Jesus has set on a hill, and he wants us to stand out so that others can see us, that they can see the light of Jesus shining from us. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be reminded of during the Reformation is what people used to do in the ancient and medieval times when they were seeking the Lord. What they would do is they would withdraw from the world and go into the monasteries uh, that was where, you know, people could really set their hearts and minds on seeking salvation without being hindered by the world. But instead of being something that's super spiritual, which is what they thought they were doing, this is actually just the opposite. It's the opposite of what our Lord wants us to be, what he saved us to be, what he left us in the world to be, which is lights, so that the world might have light. The light basically withdrew into, the, into the, the monasteries. Now, Jesus continues in verse 15. He says, Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now, what Jesus is saying here is that he didn't light us up by his Holy Spirit, recreate us into his image, only to throw a cover over the top of us, or to have us retreat into a cloister to hide our Christianity from the world. He lit us to put us on display so that we might be a source of light to all who are in the house. Basically, the house he's referring to here is the world so that we may give light to the world. And so Jesus says to us in verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are to live as Jesus calls us to live, as the Spirit is leading us to live. Remember, the Spirit is the one who is that uh, principle within us, that, that, um, well, that force, that uh, influence that is seeking to lead us in the ways of the Lord, to fulfill the law of God in us. This is what the gospel does. You know, it's not do this and you will live, but I will give you the ability to do this because I've given you life. And the Spirit is doing that, so He's leading us. And we need to follow Him. We need to become what it is He's seeking to make us, uh, to be like Jesus, as humble servants to reach out in the gentleness of love to show God's mercy to all, particularly to our, our enemies, and to seek peace. Remember, blessed are the peacemakers. To seek that peace, particularly between God and man, by sharing the gospel with others as often as we have that opportunity. Now, like Jesus, there will be those who hate us and reject us. We've already seen that. But we're not going out there for the rejection. We're going out there for those who will see what we're doing, who see what we're like, who will listen to the message, and will receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And in receiving him, receive that light of hope that the Lord gives to all who trust in him. And will also, by his grace, begin to glorify our Father in heaven in the same way that we're trying to do 
by being salt and light. Now, there's only one way that people are going to be saved, and that is if somebody who has the light shines the light to them. Well, we've been entrusted with that light. We have been made lights. Remember, we are the light of the world. We are the ones who are called to do this. And again, we may do it with varying degrees of success. It's ultimately in the Lord's hands and with a varying degrees of, of proficiency. And of course, we can get better as we, as we work at this and try. But it's something that we are, again, whether we want to be or not. Actually, we all want to be by the Spirit of God. But it's only our sin that makes us not want to be. But this is what he's made us to be. And so we need to shine so that others might come to know him and that they might come into the kingdom of light and become lights themselves. So may the Lord help us to understand that, that we are that light. That is what he has made us to be. And may he help us, as we saw this morning, as salt to become saltier, but also as lights to become brighter so that more and more people would come to know him. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord uh, to help us shine more brightly by his grace.